Son of a Vampire, a thrilling urban fantasy vampire origin novella, Dark Creatures prequel collection, book two, written by Ella Stone, narrated by Naomi Rose Mark. Chapter One, Northern France, October 1918. There was nowhere to turn, nowhere to run. On every side of him, bloodied figures fled into the night, screaming in terror, enough to shake the very earth beneath them. Hell. That was what it felt like. He had entered the gates of hell, and he had no idea how to get out again. Private Sheridan, what are you doing? Why haven't you gone? Move! Get a move on! The officer didn't wait around to see if his order was being followed, immediately disappearing into the smoke, fleeing the shouts of fear as fast as he could. Coughing against the caustic fumes, Callan tried to focus on his situation. More and more men pushed past him, not bothering to slow or apologise as they clipped him with the butts of their rifles, or trod on his already rotting feet. He didn't blame them. They were running for their lives. It was what any sensible person would do. But he couldn't leave like that. Get back! Get back! They're coming! They're coming! We need to get out of here! We have to retreat! Voices screamed endlessly amidst the grenade blasts and the rattling of machine guns. The trend had been hit again, the walls collapsing at several points. More men stumbled past him. Some had managed to drag themselves across the battlefield and fling themselves over the edge, in hope of finding safety, and still, the enemy fire was getting closer, as the ground trembled with every blast. Retreat! Retreat! A grenade hit less than ten feet away, causing the trench to erupt again. Miraculously, the blast went in the opposite direction as mud sprayed outwards, knocking him to his knees. In all his months at the front line, and all the time he'd spent in the trenches, he'd never once believed he wouldn't make it home. They'd been told God was with them in this war against tyranny, the great war to end all wars, and they'd soon be back home. His mind flashed back to his former life, his real life in London, with Ruth. He could not retreat, not yet, not with the job only half done and while people still needed him. If he closed his eyes, he could see her face, smiling back at him. In the rainstorm of mud and dirt, he could feel her breath on his neck, her fair hair brushing against his cheek. His eyes reopened to the horror all around him, he couldn't give up now. Lifting his rifle, he grabbed the ladder and started up. What the hell are you doing, Private? A hand grabbed him from behind and yanked him back down into the waterlogged pit. I told everyone to retreat. I told you to retreat. Out of a face caked in grime and dirt, his lieutenant's pale grey eyes glowered at him. It could have been night, and Callan would still have recognised those eyes. Everyone in the platoon would have. Another shell exploded somewhere behind them, Callan and Polidori flung themselves to the ground. From all around came the screams of injured men. The voices of hell. Cooper's out there, Callan said, tightening his grip on his rifle. Hatter, too, and Godfrey and Simmons, and... I get it, our men are out there. I'll go for them. You can't. He was shaking his head, trying to push down the fear. There are too many. You'll never get them all on your own. Trust me, I can do this. Lieutenant Polidori's grey eyes locked on his again. Dark Angel, they called him, although never to his face. No one was that stupid. Never had a man fought on so many battlefields and returned unhurt. More often than not, an injured comrade slung over his shoulder. He never sought acknowledgement, let alone acclaim, for these acts of bravery, brushing aside the gratitude of those who would have been dead without him. Do you trust me? he asked, because we don't have time for this. Of course I do, Callum replied. Time and time again, he'd put himself in the firing line ahead of his men. How the hell he'd survived some of the situations he put himself in was a mystery to all of them. Even now, when it felt like the end of the world was nigh, he seemed calm, as if accepting the fact that men were dying in their hundreds all around them. But what people showed and what people felt were two very different things. This war had taught Callum that, if nothing else. Get to safety, that's an order. I'll save those who can be saved. We can help more of them together. Callan insisted. Callan's hell over there, and not figuratively. It literally is hell. You have a wife, you have a life ahead of you, not to mention the fact that you can barely walk on those feet of yours. If you step out of this trench, you'll be a danger to us all, and I swear to God, I'll shoot you myself. Do you understand? His lieutenant's gaze bore into him once again. There was only one answer Polidori wanted to hear. I'll wait here, he replied, but I'm not retreating. There are too many for you to carry. Drag them here to me. I can dress their wounds while you go for another. Polidori's lips twitched. 
He didn't like being spoken back to at the best of times, and this was most certainly not the best of times. Fine, he said. Don't move. With the swiftness of a man half his age, he was up the ladder and over the top. Bracing himself and hugging his rifle, Callan searched the cacophony of noise for any distinguishable voices. They had said the war would be over by the first Christmas, and yet he had endured four years of this. His feet were now turning blue with trench foot, and his body had endured injuries that he never imagined it would be possible to take and yet keep going. But perhaps this was it, the last battle he would see. Maybe after this he could go back to Ruth and the life they planned together all those years ago. Closing his eyes, he attempted to conjure up her face again. It was getting harder to recall it, harder to remember all the little details. When he had first enlisted, he could recall every last freckle and dimple, the crooked way her mouth lifted at one side when she smiled. Was it the right side or the left? And which side was her dimple? His pulse rose. A sudden fear grabbed his chest and he reached inside his jacket and fished around for his one remaining photograph of her, now just a creased relic that showed him next to nothing. As meaningless to anyone else as if it were a note written in the foreign tongue of the barbarians they were fighting. But it was still her. He pressed it to his chest. Sheridan? Polidori's voice called from above. I've got Cooper and he's in a bad way. He was up out of the trench and by his side in an instant. The lower parts of both of Cooper's legs were missing. Crimson blood pulsed into the mud. By contrast, his cheeks were white. Almost translucent. Oh, God. God has no place here, Polidori replied. Now, get him down. Godfrey's still out there. Hatter? He shook his head. Another crack formed in Callan's already shattered heart. Now Hatter was gone too. So many men lost. Medic? Polidori yelled into the smoke as he headed back to no man's land. Callan turned back to Cooper, who, despite it all, managed a flicker of a smile. It's not that bad, right? he asked. I bet I could still kick your ass at football. Callan laughed. Gallo's humour was all they had left. He saved me, I knew he would. He'll save us all. It's all right, I've got you now. Callan crouched down, preparing to hoist the injured man onto his shoulder. When something flashed through the haze. How he spotted it was a miracle. His eyesight was hardly at his best, and the conditions had done nothing to improve it, yet, in the gloom, he caught sight of a flash of metal. A grenade. He followed its trajectory, just as his lieutenant reappeared. No! He jumped up, leaving Cooper on the ground. Of all the men in the battalion, Polidori was the one who should get to go home. He was the one who deserved it more than the rest of them. There was no way he'd be able to live with himself if he let him die, not when there was a chance of doing something to stop it. Throwing himself forward, he collided with Polidori, knocking him to the earth. The next moment, the whole world was white hot, and then it was black. Chapter 2 Drink. You must drink. Where am I? Where's Ruth? Just drink. There'll be more than enough time for questions later. As the sweetness and warmth of the liquid hit the back of his throat, he gasped in relief. His eyes blinked open. The room he was in was unfamiliar in every way. The plush purple blanket that he was lying under was a far cry from anything the army had to offer, and the four-poster bed was superior even to the one which he and Ruth had slept in during their honeymoon. From the centre of the room hung a crystal chandelier that would likely have cost him a decade's wages, although, at that precise moment, he couldn't have cared less about any of it. I need more. Give me more. He lurched forwards, his previous concerns about Ruth and his location forgotten. All that he wanted was that taste on his tongue, that comforting liquid flowing down his throat again. You've had enough for now, Callan. You have to be strong. I need more. I'm not giving you any more. Give it to me. His fist slammed hard against the bedpost. With a crack, the heavy wood splintered. What the hell? He started at the sight, but it was not just his strength that caused the air to freeze in his lungs. He turned his hand over before him. When he'd been eight years old, he'd been racing down the hill on his father's bike when he'd lost control and gone straight through the butcher's window. A piece of glass had ripped open the skin on his forearm. It had healed well enough, but it had left behind a wide scar running from his wrist to his elbow. It had been a constant reminder to him of his foolhardiness. But it was gone. What? How? He shifted back, 
clutching his knees to his chest. What's going on? Where am I? Only then did his eyes land on the man at his side. The man who had been there so many times in the trenches. Lieutenant, where are we? What happened? Polidori sat on the bed. What happened is that you saved my life. The grenade that you saw was heading straight my way. You got between it and me. The grenade. Images stirred somewhere in the back of his mind, but they were fuzzy and disjointed. He turned his attention back to Polidori, who continued to speak. You sacrificed yourself for me, and so I have repaid the favour the best I can. But I'm afraid this is going to be hard for you to take in. It may be easier to show you than to try and explain. Tell me, how fast is your heart beating? Still unable to explain the strange arm that gripped his knee, it took Callan a moment to realise a question had been asked. My heart? Yes, feel it. Demonstrate what he wanted him to do. Polidori pressed two fingertips at the base of his thumb, on his own wrist. Callum watched, wondering if the man had lost his mind. He knew his heart must be racing. He could feel goosebumps on his arms and a sweaty heat building on the back of his neck. And yet, when he rubbed the back of his neck, it was dry. And when he placed his fingers against his own skin, there was nothing. He pushed them deeper, then moved them to his neck. Then, when he found that the flesh there seemed as unresponsive as stone, he placed a palm against his chest. Again, nothing. Is this some kind of a joke? he asked, pushing himself up off the bed. What is this? Why have you brought me here? What about the war? The war is over, Callan. We've returned to my home in London, but I am so sorry you did not make it. What? Callan's face wrinkled in confusion as he shook his head. What do you mean, I didn't make it? The war must have sent Polidori mad, he realised. That was the only answer to what was going on. All that fighting, all that blood. He felt sorry for him. He was a good man, a hero. But he couldn't be subjected to this madness any longer. God alone knew what harm man in his frame of mind could inflict. Moving from the bed to the door, he pulled on the brass handle and stepped into the hallway beyond. Once again, he was faced with opulence unlike anything he'd ever encountered before. Plush red carpets, oil paintings in massive frames, stained oak banisters. The air was filled with the smell of silver polish and beeswax. At the side of the staircase, he quickened his pace and took the steps two at a time. Please don't do this. Somehow, Polidori was at the bottom of the stairs and standing in front of him, despite the fact that he had just left him behind in the bedroom. A black staircase. He shrugged. Please, just get out of my way. You'll regret this. His teeth ground together as he glowered at his lieutenant. He'd never been one for unnecessary violence or to break rank. But if what Polidori said was the truth, then the war was finished, and he was no longer subject to military regulations anyway. I have to go and find Ruth. You must forget her. You have to move on with your life. That was enough. Shoving him to the side, Callan twisted the front door handle and prepared to step outside. The intensity of the light that blasted through the open door knocked him back in surprise. What followed was pain. Pain unlike anything he'd ever experienced before, including the knife he had taken in the shoulder and the gangrene that had infected his feet in recent days. It felt as if his skin was burning. He was immediately transported back to the trenches. Mustard gas. But couldn't be. Not here. However, glancing down at his hands, he saw blisters erupting. What's happening to me? Rooted to the spot, he watched the blisters deepen and then darken to a rotting green colour. For crying out loud, get inside! Yanking him back into the house, Polidori kicked at the open door with his heel. Callan continued to stare at the wounds that pulsed and grew as he watched. What is this? What have you done to me? Like I said, I saved your life. But everything comes at a cost. Chapter 3. He led Callan to a room he called the drawing room. More paintings hung on the walls, and the seating here was in the form of chaise longs, with curved arms and velvet cushions. Although the place seemed clean, Callan's nose caught the scent of stale air and cobwebs. We are immortal. Polidori stood by the fireplace as he spoke. Despite the warmth of the house, a fire was blazing in the hearth. Perhaps it was necessary in a place like this, Callan thought. A way to prevent damp, although at that moment he wasn't aware of any. 
With a jerk of his head, he drew his attention back. Immortal? No, that, that's not possible. That's heresy. Many things do not seem possible until they are. You felt it yourself. You no longer have a pulse. Your skin blisters in the sun. So I'm what? A, a ghost? For the first time, Polidori laughed, although it was shallow and short-lived. We have had many names throughout the centuries, although none do justice to our skills and abilities. Unfortunately, as is so often the case, it is our failings that seem to define us. Our failings. An uneasy sensation was roiling through his gut. Around him, the room seemed to have fallen silent as if it too was holding its breath. You'll have to learn soon, Polidori continued. Better now, in the safety of these four walls. Learn what? he asked. His mind was flitting back and forth. With all the things he'd seen and done, he already knew that he was no longer the same person he had been before he went to war. But whatever had happened, his place was not here in some lavish London mansion. It was at home, with his wife. Whatever it took to return to her, he would do it. What do I need to learn? He asked again. Rather than offering an answer, Polidori stepped across to a small side table, beside which hung a long bell pull. He tugged on it and a girl soon appeared. She seemed younger than Callan, around 16 or 17, and, on first inspection, she fitted in well with the decor of the house. She seemed tidy and well-dressed with polished shoes, everything you would expect of a housemaid in such a stylish place. But a closer study showed something else. The slouch of her shoulders and the way her chest caved inwards made it seem as if she was in a constant state of recoil or at the very least, attempting to make herself inconspicuous. Her hair was matted in places, and the yellowing tinge of an old bruise showed ever so slightly near her left eye. Noticing Callan watching her, she looked even more anxious. Eileen, this is Callan. Yes, sir. Eileen is new to our household. She's just been released from an unfortunate situation. He turned his attention back to the maid. I'm afraid it may get a little rough. He is rather inexperienced. That's all right, my lord. Her chin bobbed in a minuscule nod, although her calm demeanour did not reflect her racing heart. If you would be so kind, Polidori asked. Trembling from head to toe, she rolled up the sleeves of her blouse. Callan gasped. Purple and blue markings covered her skin. In some places the bruises were so bad they were black. Among them were dozens of gashes, some healed to a light pink, others still open and raw. This girl must have been severely beaten. Many times. It is not painful, I take it? Polidori asked. A little, she replied. My apologies. Here. He extended his forefinger, flexing it just a fraction. Callan blinked as the nail almost doubled length. Taking the girl's hand in his own, he scratched a line in her skin. Immediately, the muscles in her face relaxed. Her heart rate slowed. Better? This time her nod was slower. Much, thank you. What's wrong with her? The tension in the room had now transferred to Callan. What have you done to her? Nothing, just a little anaesthetic, that's all. Now, come. I know you're hungry. I... I... Smell it. You need to recognise this yourself. Take a deep breath. Take it all in. Smell what? No sooner had the words left his lips than his nostrils filled with an aroma of something sweeter and more delectable than any food he'd ever encountered. The richness of it. He could almost sense the velvety smoothness. You know I can't do this for you, Polidori said. You already realise what you must do. Hunger, which only moments before had been nothing more than a vague flicker, had now gripped his body. Sweat trickled down his spine as he licked his lips, only to encounter sharp teeth now jutting from his gums. It's all right, this does not need to define you, Polidori said, his voice as soothing as a spring breeze. Take all the time you need. Callan's eyes were now locked on the young girl's arm, and the tiny trickle of blood that was seeping from the scratch that Polidori had so expertly inflicted. Drop by drop it beaded and grew, as did the hunger that had now gripped his entire body. The cup upstairs, the drink that he'd been so desperate for more of. Now he understood. Now he knew what he craved. Blood. With no notion of what he was doing, 
he took a step forwards towards the girl. Her heart fluttered faster than a fledgling taking its first flight. That's it, Polidori encouraged, barely whispering. That's it. You know what to do. Chapter 4 Every mouthful made him yearn for more. Every drop, rather than quenching his thirst, caused it to increase. He needed it. He had to have all of it. Nothing else mattered, not the missing scar on his arm, not the way his ears could pick up the sound of her heartbeat growing weaker and weaker by the second. All that mattered was slaking his thirst. He pushed the girl's wrist deeper and deeper into his mouth, sinking his fangs so far in he could taste the marrow in her bones. Yet, even then, he couldn't stop. She moaned beneath his grasp, quietly at first, then louder before fading again. When the flow slowed, he drew deeper still, drawing every last drop possible. Whether he blacked out or collapsed, he didn't know. All he knew was that when he opened his eyes again, he was lying on the floor. Next to him, drained to white, was the girl. What happened? He was on his feet almost before he'd even decided to stand. How? No! Dropping back down to his knees, he took her by the shoulders. Wake up! Wake up! Her body was limp in his arms, so he shook her from side to side with so much force, her head whipped with a cracking noise. I don't understand. It happens to all of us at first. Polidori's hand gripped his shoulder. I tried to stop you, but these things happen. It's difficult at the beginning, but you'll get used to it over time. Used to it? Realization struck. Disbelief was followed by a burning rage. In fury, he turned to his former lieutenant and lunged. Before his feet had started to rot with trench foot, he had been one of the strongest in the platoon. Even partially disabled, he could hold his own against most of the men he came up against. But as his fist struck the side of Polidori's jaw, he knew he didn't stand a chance. The second he made contact, he was knocked from his feet. In one swift movement, Polidori had twisted him around, pulling his arm up behind his back. Stretching it so far, the ball and socket were about to part company. Ah! He screamed out, fighting the pain. There was no way out of this vice-like grip. In just a flick of his wrist, Polidori could snap the bone clean in two. What have you done to me? What have I done? I saved you. I saved you, just like you saved me. No, you haven't. You have damned me. You just need time, I promise. You will come to understand what I've done for you. You'll be grateful. Grateful? I've just killed a girl. And you killed a hundred or more men in the war. Tell me, did you suffer such contrition about each of them? After you put a bullet through their chest? Well, that was not the same, wasn't it? You killed them to survive. Had there been any other choice, would you have still killed them? Of course you wouldn't. You're a good man. Same is true now. You did what you needed to do in order to survive. You have to stop thinking about what you have done and think about what you can do. What you will do. What I will do. Polidori gesticulated as he spoke. You have an eternity. A chance to right more wrongs than you can ever imagine. To change the world in ways you could only have dreamed of before. And Ruth, what about her? What about my wife? A flicker of sympathy flashed across Polidori's face. I'm sorry, Callan, but however it may seem right now, you did not survive the war. That is the only truth your wife can ever know. He was taken upstairs back to the room with the four-poster bed with a large chunk missing from one of its posts. We need to stay in the house for the time being. We cannot risk you leaving while you cannot control your thirst. Callan remained silent. Rest assured, I'll see to it that you have everything you need, and please, believe me, this time will pass. Quicker than you think. Only when Polidori was through the door did Callan open his mouth again to speak. What happens if I leave? He called after him. I could smash a window, leave at night... We're in London, are we not? I could leave and find Ruth and tell her the truth. What's stopping me? What's stopping me from telling her everything? Nothing, he replied. That's a choice you have to make, but speaking from someone who has been there, the deeper you dig yourself into a hole, the harder it is to climb out. Stepping back into the room, he let out a deep sigh. It is for personal reasons that I had to return to London. Now I realise that bringing you here, close to your old life, may not have been the wisest decision. If you would prefer, we can go elsewhere, travel to Europe. There are plenty of places there where you can convalesce and get used to your new state. Leave London. The words were as bitter as bile in Callan's throat. 
It had taken him so many years to get back here. How many letters had he written in that time? To his mother? To his sister? To Ruth? All telling them how he would survive this war. How he would come home and hold them in his arms again. He shook his head in immediate answer. I'll be fine. I will do as you say. I'll stay in the house, he said, the whole while thinking about how he would plan to escape from it. Chapter 5 From that moment, Callum worked on how to leave the house, how he could divert Polidori's attention long enough to slip out through one of the many doors or windows. With his senses now transformed since his change, he could hear the whinny of a horse at the far end of the road, or the backfire of a motorcycle engine two streets away and every sound in the house was amplified at least twenty-fold. He could hear when a maid removed her apron and hung it on the hook in the scullery. He could hear when Polidori sank his teeth into someone's flesh. He could even hear the movement of a spider as it scuttled out through a gap in a window. Of course, Polidori would have the same skills, if not greater. There would be no way of raising one of the sash windows without his lieutenant hearing. On more than one occasion, just heaving a sigh had resulted in him appearing in his doorway almost instantaneously, suggesting a game of cards or backgammon. All this waiting around reminded him of being back in the barracks, although without the risk of imminent death, but with undreamt of luxury. And so he bided his time, steeling himself to stay strong against the temptation of the housemaids when they passed nearby, while garnering as much information about the creature he had become as possible. How many of us are there? he asked Polidori one night, as he took blood from a cut crystal glass. Polidori had not run the risk of letting him feed from one of the maids again, although they continued to work in the house during the day. Whenever Callan rose, however, they were gone, no doubt a deliberate scheduling stratagem on the part of his host. Instead, they donated their blood, and a decanter was brought to him each evening. Switching to a nocturnal lifestyle had taken little adjustment, being awake in daylight hours with all the new audiovisual stimulation he now had to adjust to caused him to tire more quickly. Besides, asleep, it was easier to ignore the sense which would otherwise drive him to distraction, if not worse. All no doubt part of Polidori's plan. How many? Polidori repeated. It's impossible to know for sure. I suspect they're far more than even I am aware of. Dozens? Hundreds? Callan hazarded a guess. Polidori's eyebrow arched. Thousands. Surely not. How on earth could people not know about us if there are so many? With a sigh, Polidori took another glass and filled it from the decanter. There are enough of us to make humans wonder from time to time, but few enough encounters for them to be certain, provoking any action. Meaning? Meaning, if they were sure we existed, they would hunt us. Of course, we are stronger, we are the predators. But there again, so are lions... So are bears and wolves, and that doesn't always protect them. However, what humans lack in strength, they make up for in pure ignorance. But some people must have found out over the years. We can't always have been completely hidden. A select few, but their discovery comes with the greatest of risks. Most do not live long enough to make use of their new knowledge. So there it was. Those who unearthed the existence of vampires, and even, perhaps, thought they could live in some kind of symbiosis with them, which might even be of advantage, didn't survive long enough to tell the tale. Could he risk that with Ruth? The only way he would know would be if he told her. Watching him closely as though he could hear the thoughts whirring around in his mind, Polidori took a long draw from his glass. Blood moves more slowly than wine, thick and viscous and so much more satisfying. He'd taken enough for the night, though, and was working hard on rationing himself. The position you find yourself in is not an easy one, he said. It's hard not to see the hypocrisy in what we do, in the manner in which we feed. Many of our kind have made the mistake of thinking this makes us superior to humans. You do not. I think for any ecosystem to survive, it is a case of balance, as opposed to hierarchy. This time, Callan did need further explanation, which was no doubt conveyed by the confusion etched in his brow. Polidori smiled. Think about it. A shepherd would protect a lamb and his flock with his life, yet, if it was necessary, he would take that same lamb and sacrifice it, to maintain his own well-being. It's the same with any farmer. Just because we feed from humans doesn't mean we don't care for them. It doesn't mean we don't respect their worth. We are like the shepherds, in this respect. Please, let me guide you in this. 
Let me show you the way. A mother cat will kill her weak kitten so that the rest of the litter can survive, Callum mused. A broad smile crossed Polidori's face. Exactly. He placed his glass down on the table and leaned back in his armchair. You remember I mentioned going to Europe to convalesce? A friend of mine will be in Paris next month. I thought we could go together. See the country in a slightly more favourable light than the last time we were there? Paris, Callan said. There was no denying. His memories of France were not ones he wished to dwell on. But this could be a chance to explore the capital city and maybe find some sights to show Ruth on a later visit. It's a generous offer, but I have no money to support such a trip and the army certainly won't be giving me any demobilization pay either. The broad smile on Polidori's face stretched further still. Now that is one thing I can most certainly take care of. I'll be just outside if you need anything, sir the man said, as he swung open the final door and switched on a light. He was well-dressed and portly. Callan suspected that the fact he reeked of sweat had more to do with their presence than any lack of personal hygiene. He'd opened the bank that night especially for them, and Callan wondered how this special arrangement worked, but decided not to question it. This was his first trip outside since returning from the war, almost three months beforehand, and it was taking some getting used to. London had changed so much since he'd last been there, and in a way that left his heart almost as broken as some of the roads and buildings they'd passed. So much destruction. For most of the journey, he kept his eyes closed. It was tough enough coping with the now magnified sounds of the street without adding in any of the distressing sights. But now they were deep in the bowels of the bank. There was little to distract him, other than the pounding pulse of the manager. As they'd been guided through a series of locked doors, He'd focus on the sound of his footsteps to distract himself from the scent of human blood. Just call me if you need help, the man said again, wringing his hands nervously. That won't be necessary. Thank you, Polidori replied. As they stepped into the room, roughly the same size as Callan's old kitchen, they were met with walls lined from floor to ceiling with metal boxes of varying sizes. Each had a number, a keyhole, and a handle. Polidori turned to Callan with the closest thing to delight on his face that he'd ever seen. So, are you ready for this? For the first time since he had been transformed, he felt the smallest flutter of excitement. Placed squarely in the middle of the room was a wooden table with a chair on either side. Polidori placed his briefcase on the table and unlocked it. It opened out to reveal row upon row of seemingly identical keys, each carefully held in place with a small clip. Looking closer... Callan could see each was also numbered. I think five should be enough, Polidori said, removing a small cluster of the keys and handing them to Callan. Numbers 109 to 114. If my memory serves me correctly, they should be empty. You'll find them over there. He headed over to the corner indicated and, sure enough, found the matching boxes. Using the appropriate key, he removed the boxes one by one and took them over to the table. Judging by their weight and the fact that nothing seemed to be moving around inside, they were indeed empty. Meanwhile, Polidori had moved over to another section of wall, where he too released a box. Right, he said, bringing it over to the table. Shall we start with diamonds? Always a good choice, after all. They never lose their value. Callan realised his stunned expression must have made him look somewhat ridiculous, but it was jaw-droppingly unbelievable. It just didn't seem possible. A dozen cut diamonds, each bigger than the walnut, sat in a velvet bed. I had a stroke of luck with my timing in South Africa, Polidori told him, as he lifted one out and placed it carefully into one of the empty boxes. He transferred two more into the box before closing and locking it. This process was repeated with similarly sized emeralds. Next came sapphires and, lastly, rubies. With only one box remaining, it was time for gold, Standing there, watching it all, Callan hadn't dared speak or even move, other than to return each box to its home. He was staring at the bars of gold Polidori was now transferring, when he finally managed to muster a voice. All of this? All of this is yours? It is. How? It was a question he wasn't sure he wanted answered. It was only too easy to imagine how he'd come into possession of such wealth. Yet it didn't somehow seem his style. He'd never struck him as an avaricious man. I was left, shall we say, a small amount of wealth by the vampire who turned me. Since then, I've had plenty of time to invest, 
Spice trails, diamond and gold mines, even railway. I was there to do it all. With the last box now tightly packed with gold and taken back to its place, with an ease no mere human could have managed, Polidori replaced half of the keys and closed his case. These are for you, he said, handing the keys to boxes 109 to 114 to Callan. We'll need some cash, too. We'll organise that up top. Polidori moved to the door, but Callan didn't follow immediately. His eyes were fixed on the small pieces of metal in his hands. Such tiny things, but with the potential to change so many lives. One of those diamonds alone, how much would that be worth? He couldn't even hazard a guess. Probably more than he could earn in ten lifetimes. And yet there he was, being given them as though they were nothing special at all. Why are you doing this? Why on earth? He asked. Why? I thought that would be obvious. If I have to spell it out, there are several reasons. I had been arrogant enough to think that immortal and invincible were the same thing. I had made no arrangements for my wealth should I meet my end. But, more importantly, I would not be here now if it were not for you, Callan. My debt to you is far greater than any gift could ever repay. Also, he continued, You are my responsibility, as you told me on that first day. You didn't ask for this life, and currently, you are ill-equipped for it. This gift should go some way towards rectifying that. There seemed no words adequate enough to express his gratitude for what he just received, yet those were all he had to offer. Thank you, he said. I would suggest investing. Perhaps not straight away. You should see a little bit of the world first. Find out where your heart lies. That seemingly innocuous line caused Callan's thoughts to flick back to the place where he knew his heart lay. With Ruth, her legs wrapped around him as he kissed her. Her lips her neck, his mouth moving lower and lower down her body. He shook the image from his mind. However, there is one thing I need from you, Polidori continued. Of course, tonight I must go out. I could arrange for someone to stay with you, but I thought that perhaps... You want to know if you can trust me to stay in the house on my own? Callan finished for him. Can I? Callan immediately knew the answer. Despite that, he lifted his gaze and looked Polidori square in the eyes. Of course you can, he said. Chapter 6 Excuse me, sir. The voice startled Callum for a moment. Can you spare some change? What? Some money. Can you spare some money or food? Money or food? Money was something he had plenty of. Polidori had shared with him a generous portion of the cash he had withdrawn the previous night, Just looking at it and imagining how he could have used it in his previous life had been a useful distraction. He had waited in the house alone that evening, not knowing how far Polidori had gone or how long he would be away. A man with his own vault in a bank would not be stupid enough to simply walk out the front door and leave him unattended without second thought. So he had waited until he had heard the car leave, and then waited longer still. After an hour he had left, keeping to the shadows, his pockets stuffed full of notes, and a scarf wrapped tight around his ears to protect himself from the sound of pulsing blood as he passed people in the street. And he'd done it. He had managed to slip through the night, unnoticed. Until now, the boy barely came up to his waist. Poorly dressed, his shoes were falling off his feet, and he had holes in his filthy trousers. His face was covered in so much dirt that his eyebrows were barely visible but the whites of his eyes shone clear, if laced with red threads. His hand reached out and touched Callan's. Please, sir, any change, he pleaded, looking at him with those bloodshot eyes. Suddenly, the warmth of the boy was flooding into him, becoming a heat that threatened to consume him, and a desire was sweeping over him, the promise of gratification now becoming his central thought. The boy looked nervous and moved away, and the connection snapped, leaving only a chill running down Callan's spine. Wait, stay here, he called, and without even having to think about it, he was right back alongside the boy, grabbing him by his wrists, desperate to feel that same flood of warmth again. The boy's pulse was strong, pounding the rhythm of his heartbeat, as fresh, warm blood pumped through his veins. The smell, the taste be just like the girls that first time, Callan thought. He shook the image from his mind, 
He hadn't been prepared then. He hadn't known what he was capable of. This would be different. This time he would be in control. His mouth was watering, his jaw aching to strike. What he wouldn't give for another taste of warm blood, just one small taste. Shaking his head again, he lowered himself down to the boy's hide and locked his eyes on him. Run, he hissed. The boy didn't need telling twice. Pitting himself against the wall, Callum watched as the child raced away, only looking over his shoulder once, to make sure he wasn't being followed. What was he doing? He asked himself as he stood there, dizzy and breathless, reeling from an event that hadn't even happened. He managed to stop himself. The boy was safe, but how many others would still be at risk? His mind went immediately to Ruth. Could he hurt her? Of course not. The thought was beyond preposterous. If anything, she would be the one to help him stop all those cravings. Which is why getting to her was the only thing that mattered. As he thought of her, he was suddenly transported to one of their last nights together. In London, before he'd left for war. We should wait. Don't you think we should wait? No. He slipped his hands around her waist. I don't think we should. I think we should get married now. Right now. It's the middle of the night. I know. Let's go to the church. The priest will be up, won't he? I'm sure they don't sleep. Oh, Callan, stop it. Laughing, she grabbed him by the hand and pulled him to her. His lips fell against hers, a little clumsier than he had intended, and yet she held him steady there. Under the sulphur-yellow glow of a street lamp, he brushed his hand against her cheek, drinking in the texture of her skin, the shine in her eyes. She thought he was being ridiculous, that the exhilaration of enlisting had somehow made him reckless, as it had with so many men. But it wasn't the case. He'd been waiting for this day from long before the war had even been rumoured. If we don't do it now, then we'll have to wait until I get back, and I don't want that. I don't want to have to wait another day, yet alone another year, until I can be your husband. I want it to be right now. You're not thinking straight. Of course I am. You can find a house while I'm gone. A home for us. Fix up the rooms just how you like. Paint the front door yellow. Yellow? He dipped his chin, placing his lips on her face, and tracing a line down her neck. Callan, you're drunk. You're being ridiculous. Peeling his lips away from her skin, he pushed himself back until he was at arm's length and gazed into her eyes. Her pupils were like the blackest of pearls, sparkling in the lamplight. Ruth Elspeth Allen, I've loved you since we were 14 years old. You're the only girl I've ever kissed, and I never plan on changing that. When I get back from this war, I don't want to find my girlfriend waiting for me. I want to be with my wife, in the house she has found for us while I was away, with the door she's painted yellow, like the sun, so I never need to struggle to find her on nights when the street lights go out. You're my wife, Ruth, in my heart of hearts. You're the only woman who I will ever love. Please, let me prove this to you. Please. Marry me. And then to prove that it wasn't the enlisting, or the drink, or even the moonlight that was prompting him. He went down on one knee and held out the ring he had brought over a month earlier. So will you make me the happiest man on the planet? For the rest of my life? That smile. How one single smile could light up a room like that was impossible to believe until you saw it. Her eyes alone were enough to make him feel transported with pure ecstasy. He returned to the moment. Standing there that night, she had made him feel he was never going to be alone again. Not for the rest of his life. But his life had ended. He immediately knew which house it was. The paint on the door was peeling in thick, dark curls. Doubtless fire damage, judging by the state of nearby buildings. But flecks of the bright yellow still remained evident. But even without this, he would have known. If someone had asked him what Ruth smelt like when he was human, he would have come up with some try answer like fresh bread or honeysuckle. Now he knew how wrong he had been, how much more there was to her. The aroma of her hair, her lips, her clothes, hints of peppermint and lavender combined with undertones of soap and charcoal. Every exquisite facet of her which mingled together to make that single perfect scent. That was Ruth. 
and now he was standing only feet away from her. Watching her silhouette through the glass of the door, he thought about the last time he'd seen her. She hadn't gone to the station to wave him off like so many of the men's sweethearts. Their love wasn't new. They didn't need big declarations or promises. He knew that she'd be waiting when he returned. That last night before he'd left, when they'd only been married six weeks, had been their big farewell. They were staying at her sister's house, and she'd given them as much privacy as she could, spending time at her in-laws. Her own husband had shipped off four weeks previously, and Callan and Ruth had moved into her spare room while they waited for a place of their own. That was what they'd said, at least. In truth, it was to keep her company, one of the kindest gestures they could have offered. On that last night, he had one goal in mind, to memorize every last inch of her body. She bought a new nightdress, white, satin, the thin straps tracing a line down from her collarbone, lifting up away from the flesh just before her breasts. The blinds were drawn and a small candle caused shadows to dance on the walls around them. He followed down the line of one strap with a finger, curving back up the other side, and brushing the skin under her cheek. All the time their eyes remained locked, as his heart pounded in his chest. He moved his hand down towards her legs, her lips parted in anticipation. A small gasp left her mouth. In one sweep he pulled the garment over her head. First his hand went to her hips, tracing an arc between one side and the other. He then used the back of his hand to mark out each one of her curves. A light freckle showed just below her belly button. With his heart still pounding, he brought his lips to it and pressed them gently there. He responded to every move of her body, every moan that escaped from her. He caressed her shoulders, the backs of her arms, her knuckles, her ankles. He needed to feel every single inch of her skin beneath his lips. And with each touch, the urgency grew. By the time he had returned to her lips, he was breathless and his body was aching, needing hers in every way possible. You'll come back to me, won't you? She asked, holding his face between her hands. You promise you'll come back? This, he said, cupping her chin. You. You are what I'll be fighting for every single day. She was still sleeping when he had left. The candle extinguished in a pool of wax. There was no need to wake her. No need for any more pain. They would soon be together again. That was what he had thought. Now, he was finally back. Chapter 7 His mind focused on her warmth. He moved out from the shadows and over towards the door. With his long fingernail, he chipped off a piece of the curling yellow paint, which fluttered downwards only to be picked up by the breeze, and spun off onto a different course. Holding his breath, he placed his hand against the wood. He shouldn't go any further, he knew he shouldn't. How could he hold her? How could she find comfort in a body now as cold and hard as stone? Coming back had been a mistake. Pain now consuming him. He turned around to leave. He'd only gone a few steps from the door when the click of the lock sounded in the night air. Callan. His name on her lips was like oxygen to a drowning man. He kept his back to her. He was still in the shadows. He should keep walking and disappear into the night. And yet, even as he thought this, he knew he couldn't. Every day since he'd left, every moment spent fighting and then in Polidori's house, had been leading up to this moment. He turned around and stepped into the yellow glow of the streetlight. I'm here, Ruth, he said. I'm here. The lamps were spluttering on and off. Silence surrounded them. Seconds passed. He could hear her breathing, her heart pounding. She finally spoke, her voice cracking. Callan, I, I don't understand. Is that really you? It is. He took another step forward. One more and he would be able to touch her, hold her in his arms. Every fibre in his body yearned to take that step, 
but the sweet smell of her was already causing him to lose his vision. If he got any closer, he might not be able to stop himself. Callan! She went to move towards him. His stomach lurched. Stay where you are, he ordered, the harsh timbre of his voice resonating in the air. He saw shock and pain and fear register on her face. Fighting the urges coursing through him, he softened his tone. Please, please don't come closer. It's not safe. What do you mean? Please, just trust me. She nodded and took a small step backwards. They told me you were dead. I know. So what's happening? Are you really here? He slowly nodded once. Her heartbeat, which had begun to steady, suddenly quickened with a rush of adrenaline. She staggered forwards, and for a second, he thought she was going to faint. But she caught her hands on her knees and managed to stay upright. His intellect and his instincts were in conflict as he fought the urge to go to her. Of all the battles he'd taken part in, never had one been like this. How was he meant to do this? How could he just watch her suffer? Five words were all that he could manage. I'm not the same, he said. Few men are, she replied. Few of us women either. This is different. I could see that. His heart ached. How does she make everything seem so simple, so straightforward? Would you like to come inside? I don't think I can. Nodding, she lowered her eyes to the hem of her cardigan, where her slender hands fiddled with the frayed edges. Her fingers were thinner, and the skin around her knuckles was cracked. He could feel the hurt and confusion radiating from her, and at that moment, all he wanted to do was to take her hands in his and kiss every single part of them. Well, maybe for just a minute, he said. He followed her into the house, a shiver running down his spine. After so many weeks of Polidori's, it was smaller than he could have imagined. The closeness of the walls amplified the sounds and aromas within it. She moved through the hallway and into the front room. While she took a seat on the sofa, Callan headed straight for the fire. May I? he asked, indicating the pile of logs beside it. The flames were still strong, but if she were to reach out and touch him, he first needed to get all the warmth that he could. Of course. He stoked up the fire, using the bellows to intensify the heat. All the while, he could feel her eyes boring into him. Coming inside had been a mistake, he told himself. Even coming to this road had been wrong. He couldn't leave now, but he could still find no words to offer her that didn't feel like a betrayal. Only when the blaze was so intense that he risked turning around to face her, did she speak again. Will you tell me? she asked. Tell you what? All of it. Everything. His stomach tightened. Uh, there's a hell of a lot. So start with where you've been these last few months since the war ended. Her voice was matter of fact. Not cold, but analytical. No hysterics, which most men would have expected, had their wives just learned they were back from the dead. And no one was deader than him. But this was Ruth's style. She needed all the facts before she made a judgment. I've been here in, in London, he answered. A flicker of sadness crossed her face. Where, with someone from the army? With a friend? He nodded. A woman? Not as you would think. She pressed her lips together. If she'd shouted at him, blamed him for not coming straight back to her, that would at least have given him something to react to. Instead, all he could do was wait. Were you afraid of something? She finally asked. Afraid of something that could hurt me? Afraid that you would hurt me? He snorted. I am terrified of hurting you he said. She nodded silently as tears tumbled down her cheeks. I've seen it with some of the men who have returned. Things you've had to endure, it's no wonder. This is not the same as that. I'm not the same as those men. Why? Because you've fallen out of love with me. What? No. Before he could think of what he was doing, he'd crossed the room and taken hold of her hands. He dropped them in an instant, but her gasp said it all. Callan! 
What's happened to you? He backed away and returned to the fire and the safety of its warmth. I'm not the man you knew. I don't even think I'm a man anymore. I don't know what I am. He turned away. Red and orange flames flickered as the fire crackled and spat. Breaking wood sent sparks up into the air. He turned back to her. What do you believe in? He asked. What do I believe in? Yes, do you believe in God? Of course I do. Then in that case you must believe in the devil too. And in the devil's servants that walk among us. Callum, please, you're making no sense. I'm your wife. You just have to tell me the truth. She moved slowly as if she was attempting to corner a feral animal. Her hand reached out towards him. In an instant, he darted across the room, faster than her eyes could follow. How? Her jaw dropped. The colour drained from her cheeks, but still, she moved towards him, backing him against the curtains. Please, Ruth, I shouldn't have come here. Yes, you should. This is where you belong. You belong here, with me. She took another step forward. Her heart was steady now. A constant throb. How could she be so calm? His own body was twitching. Hackles rising with the fear of what might happen next. She lifted her hand to his cheek. Ruth. It's fine. You're safe. No. It was a snap decision that he wasn't even conscious of making, but there it was, out in the open. Two fangs, glistening in the firelight. Dear Lord. Her hand flew to her mouth. Regret flooded through him. He could see it all in her eyes, the confusion, then the terror, the disgust. Unable to bear looking at her, he bowed his head. A moment later, a surge of warmth flooded through his cheek. Callan. This time she didn't recoil at the cold as she touched him. Her hand remained there, the warmth of her flesh seeping into him, soothing him. It was more than he could stand. Ruth. Shh, you poor, poor thing. It's okay now, my love. Whatever happened? Whatever they did to you, it's okay. You're home. I'm here. And then, for the first time since those first days on the front line, Callan cried, sobbing as he had not done since he'd been a small child. He buried his head against her chest, ignoring thoughts of his cold body pressed against her. He needed her warmth. He needed her scent. He needed all of her. Murmuring sweet nothing, she stroked his hair. It was intoxicating. And beneath it all, the same steady beat of her heart. It's okay, my love, you're home now. You're home. But he could no longer hear her voice. His mind was now fixed on the drumming of her pulse. The sound of the chambers of her heart opening and closing. His fangs were still out and his throat was dry. But he would not, could not hurt her, he told himself. But with each stroke of her hand, he could feel his determination slipping, his strength ebbing away. Wordlessly, Ruth cupped his chin, moving his mouth to meet hers. He could have been drunk the way the world slipped out from beneath him, as he felt her lips against his own. They moved slowly at first, then faster, and with more urgency than ever before. He pulled her closer, grabbing fistfuls of her hair, savouring the taste of her. His kisses traced along her jawline and down to the crook of her neck. Callan! She broke away, her voice trembling, fear flashing in her eyes. But he didn't care. With his hands still in her hair, he yanked her back towards him, returning his lips to her throat. Callan! She snapped back this time, pushing her hand against his chest. What are you doing? What the hell are you doing? Her hand flew to her neck, to where his lips had been. That was when he saw it. The trickle of blood seeping out from between her fingers. And he could smell the adrenaline, like a rabbit, 
having just caught sight of the fox. His throat ached. Just a single drop. That was all he needed. If he could just taste that tiny bit of her. Epilogue. He ran into the night, the sound of sobbing echoing behind him. Somehow he'd pulled himself away and moved faster than he ever had before. He didn't hear the screams of the children or the shout of the drunk. All he felt was the wind against his skin. When he reached the house, he rushed upstairs and packed a bag. He would tell Polidori they needed to go straight away. They could travel, skip Europe and head straight to India, Africa, Asia, as far away as possible. That night he made himself the promise that he would never set foot on that island again. Not while there was any chance he could hurt her. Callan Sheridan would not return to London, as long as Ruth was alive. This has been Son of a Vampire, a thrilling urban fantasy vampire origin novella, Dark Creatures prequel collection book two, written by Ella Stone, narrated by Naomi Rose Mark, copyright 2021 by Ella Stone, production copyright by Ella Stone.